Warning, the podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. Forensics with Laura Sudkamp and Marcy Atkins, part one of three. Hi, it's David with the Murder Police Podcast. For this three-part miniseries, me and Wendy sat down with two forensic scientists from the Kentucky State Police Forensic Services for a candid conversation about forensics. Those people happen to be Division Director Laura Sudkamp and Forensic Scientist Specialist 2, Marcy Adkins. One of the big highlights of my time in homicide was working with the professionals at the Kentucky State Police Forensic Services. Everyone, and I mean that sincerely, was always willing to go above and beyond. As a detective, these people were clearly on the team. They were educational. Yes, they would even tell us whether or not we were in the right direction and straighten us out when we were making mistakes. And they really took the protocols seriously in order to safely fact find for the cases they were working. And as with any real team, many of us got to know one another over the years. And instead of just a name and a signature on a lab report, we knew just who they were. Now, unlike TV and Hollywood fantasy, the field of forensics is very real, and extremely dedicated people make careers in the industry, quietly seeking the truth and providing advocacy for crime victims. These episodes that we're about to deliver are for the true crime fan that is interested in the mechanics of a murder investigation and not just the salacious details of a murder. It is also perfect for those that are considering entering the world of forensics as a career. This is a must listen for you if that's where you're headed. And as always on the Murder Police podcast, we're going to explore the personal side of this work, not just the technical. So what you're going to hear for the next few episodes is the story of the real world of forensics, which is nothing like what you've seen on TV. You're going to hear exactly how evidence is actually submitted and handled. And that might surprise you sometimes about how much time that takes. You are also going to hear what kind of background do you need to have and how to prepare yourself if you're trying to get into the forensics field. This is really important to listen to because they're going to help you prepare for that by actually teaching you that in these episodes. You will also hear what you can expect in the field once you get there. The training, the ongoing training, the fact that you have to conduct yourself appropriately during courtroom testimony and how often that might happen. More importantly, you're going to hear the personal impact because of the work. All kinds of neat things with the sciences, DNA, genetics, serology, CODIS, robots, RFLP, SNPs, PCR, and of course, the beast, which you'll learn about in here. So take a listen and make sure you tell your friends about these episodes, especially if they are interested in making a difference through an amazing career. Now let's jump in to the conversation. Today on Murder Police Podcast, we have Marcy and Laura joining us. Thank you, ladies, for coming. And Marcy, why don't you start with telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, thanks for having us. Um, my name is Marcy Adkins. Uh, I, my, my title is a forensic scientist specialist, too. I work in the area of forensic biology, and there I am competency tested and proficient in serological testing, which is the identification of blood, semen, and saliva. I do DNA analysis, and I also do paternity and other kinship analysis. Very neat. So... We have the Real Forensic Files sitting right here with us today. Miss Laura, how about yourself? Thank you for coming. And tell us a little bit about you. My name is Laura Sudkamp, and I'm the Division Director for the Forensic Services Division at the Kentucky State Police. Uh, I've got 32 years in the system. I originally was a drug chemist. Uh, so if you were arrested with a powder or a pill or marijuana, uh, it would come to the laboratory and I would determined that it really was cocaine and not that you were bringing a bag of sugar to your neighbor. Um, I was going to say, if it's mine, it's baking soda, just to get that on the record. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also, I also, before I became a drug chemist, I was an intern in the forensic biology section. We were bringing on the DNA program. 
Um, while when I came in, Lucy Davis uh, went off to the FBI for six weeks to be trained to do DNA, and then she came back and. I had to help her set everything up, and I started extracting uh, DNA out of troopers' blood samples, um, which was really, really neat. But I ended up in the drug section, and then I've moved up through supervision. Um, I went into management and worked the um, grants and all the purchasing for the entire lab system. And then I got pushed over into managing uh, the central lab, and ultimately now I am over all six laboratories. How neat. Well, we have a lot of experience sitting here with us, and we are we are so glad that you have joined us today. And I can't wait to hear about your all's careers because I, I guess not necessarily your careers, but your day-to-day duties because I, I covet forensic, forensic sciences. And we have also here with us David. Hello. As usual. Hello. Exactly. The baking soda guy. The baking soda guy. Good deal. Well, I'll tell you what, that, that's pretty cool. Let's go a little bit deeper and, and start with Marcy. Uh, how did you get interested in the field? Well, um, I started in 1998. So <clears throat> just a little math, that was 22 years ago. And back then, we didn't have shows like CSI or Forensic Files or things like that. So when I applied for this position, I was coming from the restaurant field, and I knew I didn't want to do the hard labor of that anymore. And I wanted to use my degree. So, but I honestly, I had no idea. I was applying for a forensic serologist position and I had no idea what that was going to entail. So I had no idea what I was getting into. I just knew I wanted to do DNA somewhere. And it just happened to be really a perfect fit for me because it's just so, the work is so varied and so interesting. And I I fell into it and I consider myself very lucky for that. And what degree did you have that you were using? Um, I I graduated from the University of Kentucky. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Biotechnology, which is kind of roundabout genetic engineering. Gotcha. So I studied mostly genetics. And And so what drove you to that degree field? Well, I was in high school and I had a biology teacher and we were learning about different genetic disorders. And I knew... This is really corny, but I knew right then in high school that I wanted to do something with DNA. That is awesome. Just to have that that kind of vocation speak to you at that young age, that's pretty neat. And real quick, just uh, for listeners, you, you used the word serology. What what was serology back then? It is the same as it is now. It, it's, it means a little something different to the forensic world than it does to the rest of the world. Uh, serology is typically the analysis of blood. Uh, However, for us, we use it to cover the field of body identification. So we're using, we're testing for blood, semen, and saliva, and we group all of that into this uh, sub-discipline called serology. Cool. I've never heard it broke down that way before. It uh, And again, what, what about your career so far? Where, where did you first start it, again? And we might be recovering that, but when you first got involved, was the KSP lab the first place you landed? I had a job right out of college where I was working in a research laboratory, and I knew that research really wasn't for me. I was more, I think you've got research scientists and then you've got applied scientists, and I knew I wanted to apply my knowledge somehow. I applied for KSP, and like Laura, I started as a, kind of a technician of sorts. So I would make reagents for people, and then um, I did various other tasks. But the the lab grunt work that you know, keeps things going, ordering, stocking, things like that. So when a permanent position opened up, I applied, and I got it. Um, and that was in the database unit. So that's where all the convicted offender samples go and get put into the database. And then this database is stored so that forensic cases can be run against it to hopefully generate an investigative lead for officers. So I started there, but then I moved into casework, and that's where I've been ever since. Is that database uh, 
attached to like a national database? Does it integrate with anything other than the stuff that you all have at the lab at KSP? Yes, it's the FBI's, it's the CODIS database. So CODIS stands for the Combined DNA Index System. It's run by the FBI. It connects all the laboratories across the country at the national level. And then we also have state databases as well. So it have, exists as a hierarchy. Since you've been there, have you seen that uh, lay any cases down or uh, like approve anything? If you had any matches that have mattered since you've been there? Tons of them. Oh, that's we're going to get into that. We got to <laughs> talk about that. that Because I know back in the day when I did it, that was like a scratch off lottery is that you felt when you got the call, that was incredible. And then that goes back a ways. We were talking before we start recording that it was in its infancy would probably be a way to put it, too. So. Fantastic stuff. Laura, do the same thing. Talk about where the passion came from, what you did to prepare for it, and, and, and whatnot. So when I was in high school, I thought I wanted to go into law enforcement. Um, I wanted to be a police officer. So I started with the University of Kentucky um, in high school with one of their explorer programs and um, loved it. Absolutely loved it. And we would go help with the um, football game traffic. And we figured out I have a temper. Oh, God. <laughs> um, and uh, the University of Kentucky police officers were great, and they recognized that temper that was in me. You know, tell you once to do something and you don't do it. I'm going to make sure you understood me the second time. And uh, if you still don't do it, then, shoo, I have very well-behaved children, by the way. I can only imagine. <laughs> and nothing, nothing will show temper like traffic. Yes. Like traffic. I always tell people they're – they're like, you know, in their career, what's the wildest thing? And, and I'm, I'm being honest with you, probably the most virulent and violent person in, in a mild thing. And we dealt with others was riding a fire lane ticket in a shopping center. I had to push a guy back into his car one time just to keep us both out of trouble. And so, yeah, it, it the people's responses to those small things like you can't turn right right here right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll test your temper. Yeah. So good for you. I'm glad you recognized it. I did. And so um, they got me, they knew I was good in the sciences in high school. So they actually got me a tour of the crime lab um, when we all went. But that was when I knew. So when I was a junior, senior in high school, I knew I was going into forensics. Um, and so I still give them credit for that. I saw a bunch of them a little while ago and uh, I tell them thank you all the time for my career in forensics. Awesome. So when you talked about you knew in high school, so what did you start doing to uh, prepare yourself for that? What did, what did you start as far as planning your education and what your focus was going to be? What else did you do? Well, I knew that it was going to require either a biology degree or a chemistry degree. Forensic science degrees at the time, um, I, I don't think they were there or they were just starting. So um, I took, I had the option in high school to like take typing, not keyboard or whatever they call it now, but typing classes where you use the typewriter. Um, and instead of taking that, I took physics class. So it was classes like that where I knew if I could get a better understanding with biology and chemistry and physics, the classes I was going to have to take in college, that it would give me a, you know, a firmer basis upon which to um, develop my educational skills. It was entertaining because I did have a little bit too much fun when I moved to college. So that was an education in and of itself, but it definitely, it was a good thing that I had prepared in high school for um, these tougher classes. The chemistry classes that you have to take, and I do have a chemistry degree, they send you through general chemistry and organic chemistry. Well, those classes, it's two semesters for each one uh, with labs, and those classes are taken by all the pre-med folks. And so they're trying to weed a lot of them out, and so they are very tough courses. It, it was not fun. P-chem, my abs physical chemistry, I absolutely hated, but I did get through that. But my my basic... When I knew this is what I wanted to do, I went and looked to see what the degree re requirements were. Um, and for biology, just so you know, with, if you're going to do DNA, you have to have molecular biology. Yes. Uh, also biochemistry, statistics, and cell biology. Uh, I'm out. <laughs> Well, genetics. Yeah. genetics. Sorry, genetics. genetics. That was the one. I'm that's still a, hanging on to the Explorer program. I yeah. want to hear about that traffic that's right up my alley. Uh, no, it's not. And anyway, yeah, I always tell people that I took a police administration back in the 80s because they had no math. And it was, hey, that's for me. Is that, hey, no math, I'm good for that. I didn't have to pick that up until later. But 
for chemistry, you have to go all the way through calculus four. Uh, da, da, da. So, but um, all kidding aside, if if because we're going to have people listening right now, and I'm guaranteeing you they're interested in the forensics field for all the right reasons. Is this still a path that you would start to suggest people start to anchor into to to look at? Definitely. Good. Because I think that's practical advice. It is that if you run, if you want that dream to come true, you have to start laying that groundwork pretty early on that. Well, good deal. And what school did you go to? Where'd you get your degrees? I'm also from the University of Kentucky. Oh, because when you said party, and I thought that was Eastern Kentucky University. <laughs> exactly. Honey, only because you went there. Exactly. And the, I, I have some memories of that. Not not many, but some. But anyway, yeah, that's that's good. Well, go go cats for sure. Yes. Go cats. So you get your education and tell us a little bit more about how your career started and, and where'd you first land? So when I first started, um, I was still at the university. Uh, I knew I wanted to go into forensics and arranged a an internship. And that was where they were doing DNA or starting up DNA. Uh, Lucy Davis went to the FBI for six weeks. Um, I helped out in serology during that six weeks. But when she came back, I basically was there, started in January and went through August of just helping them set things up, get getting the DNA extracted. That was by the old method, RFLP. I uh, did a lot of DNA extractions and then handed them off to Lucy and Larry and let them run them. Back in that day, you would run them through, it was a radioactive marker, basically, that you would end up putting on x-ray film and then you had to go stick the x-ray film in the freezer and we would go run to UK um, to the Markey Center and put them in the freezer for six weeks and then you got to pull them back out after six weeks and then you knew whether or not your run even worked. It took forever. What I was going to say, how how did you get that done in 20 minutes like on TV? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to do the math and again, I'm not strong in it. That's what I think people don't understand is, you know, the history of it and that um, unfortunately it's not like a you know, the 20-minute the commercial break on forensics and, and CSI and stuff like that. Real quick, let's back up. Who's Lucy and who's Larry? Because we've, we've used their names. We need to give them credit for who they are. Uh, Lucy Davis was uh, the forensic biologist that went to the, um, the FBI and brought DNA into Kentucky. Uh, and then Larry Ayers was the supervisor over that section and another serologist, DNA analyst. And he was one of the first trained under Lucy to... Um, to assist in working the cases. Are they still at the lab? No. Larry retired a long time ago, and Lucy now still lives in Kentucky. She went away various states. She was in West Virginia for a while, but she does a lot of consulting. She's independent. Hmm, good for her. So she's still in the field. Good. Yeah. It, uh, it, uh, that probably, it, it'd it be hard to leave. it uh, Because, of, like you, I think, Marcy, you said the variety of the things, like, Actually practicing that instead of doing research is that uh, just getting those nitty gritty details that nobody else has, you know, and, yes. and you know, we, we've talked before we started recording on some of the cases that we probably crossed paths on or whether we knew it or not uh, when I would send stuff up to the lab. It, tell me more. I think you moved into supervision at some point. When did that happen? Uh, that happened in 1998. So I started in 89 and then 1998, I promoted into supervisor over um, a research project that went through HIDA, the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, uh, that was West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee. It was a three state. And it was the goal was to do, um, we called it the Signature Laboratory, to look at, let's say you had a huge semi full of marijuana. Where was it grown? Could you look at the chemical composition of the plant and figure out where it was grown? I started that project, but I promoted up um, within like a year and a half shortly after that to into the purchasing and the grant writing. And they were trying to do DNA on the marijuana, right? They did. And uh, Dr. Margaret Sanger um, actually has a patent through Kentucky State Police where we did patent the DNA from the, from the marijuana. And what was the purpose of the, the DNA uh, in the marijuana? Same thing for location or? Trying to see whether or not you could track families back, there we um, go. but we didn't get that get that far. Connecticut, I think, ended up taking on the research. The Haida program got cut back on in funding and decided to science is expensive, so um, that stepped back. I think after like three years. Hmm. It's, and and I never knew that too. Pretty fascinating. Pretty fascinating. And a whole other aspect of DNA that I hadn't thought about before. 
So you're still in supervision. In supervision, Laura, do you still get to actually play? Do you still get to get into the lab and do cool things? Not very often. Yeah. When new technology is coming along, a lot of times I'll go take a look at it and go play. But I haven't worked a case in since two, nah, 2000, 2002, somewhere in there. Miss it? I do sometimes. It's nice just to be able to pull. I would love to be able to pull 10 cases, sample them, put them back, write them up, and be done. You know, actually accomplish something. Yeah, that's a neat perspective. Well, both of y'all, too, because uh, we've talked about it, and, and you're from the Kentucky State Police Crime Laboratory. This is important because in the episodes that we've aired so far, I'm thinking virtually every episode a detective has is, is, uh, talked about the lab and the importance of it and how good the lab is. Just got to be honest. I mean, you know, it did, I've, I'm just going to be a spoiler on that, that. I think the relationship's always been pretty good. Tell us about the KSP Crime Lab, uh, how, where it's at, uh, locations, uh, uh, and just more about what they do, what do they offer. There are six labs across the state. I always have to do this. Western Kentucky is Madisonville, then Louisville, then Cold Spring up in Campbell County, Ashland, London, and Frankfurt. Frankfurt is the only full-service laboratory, so we over we offer all of the disciplines, um, which are the forensic biology casework, the forensic biology, which is the DNA database, trace, which could be arson, GSR, poisons, hairs, fibers. They're huge on everything that they do. The firearm section, then you have the solid dose dr drug section where they're looking at the actual drug themselves, and then the toxicology section that works, um, not mostly DUI cases, but if you've got a drug-facilitated sexual assault, they get samples from that. Or if there was some other fight or assault, they will get sometimes samples from other types of cases and homicide cases. That's why I was going to ask if they did the homicide cases. Yes. If somebody needs to know if somebody was on something, they end up with it. Have you all always worked in Frankfurt or have you been to the other labs and done any work there? I've always been in Frankfurt. I have always been in Frankfurt as well, but I was technical leader over the serology labs and I would go visit and I did a stint also where I was working with a new analyst at the Northern Laboratory so that they could maintain their accreditation for a while, a few years back. Pretty cool. So you got to travel a little bit with that. Well, good deal on the technology end of it then. What kind of law enforcement agencies do you all work with? Who, who can bring things to the lab and ask for services, analysis of, of materials and whatever, who all can do that? We accept requests from all law enforcement agencies in Kentucky. So in any given year, there are like over 400, almost 450 law enforcement agencies in Kentucky. Uh, we probably get evidence from 380 to 400 of those uh, each year. We get in over 50,000 submissions a year. Majority of those are about thirty to forty thousand, about thirty thousand are drug based. About nine thousand are going to be DUI related, and then you it breaks down from there. Biology runs about two thousand cases a year. Uh, firearms runs probably five to seven hundred. Trace is about five five hundred. Uh, so they're much smaller. Most of it is drugs and talk. So when we get backlogged in those areas, that's when the courts really start screaming at us because it blocks their whole docket up. And I lost track of what the question was. Oh, just uh, who can bring things to the lab. We also will accept evidence from prosecution, um, defense, even if it's an ex parte order where um, we're not allowed to disclose to anyone that the request has come through. What we tend to do is take a request form and have them list, you know, th the three items they want tested but also to include some other items so that defense really doesn't or the prosecutor doesn't really know what it is that defense is honing on because it's a law enforcement agency that has the evidence. So it's got to come in and they don't have to disclose, you know, those lab results or what they're they're doing to the prosecution. So they try to hide it as best they can. So they will bring it in. Um, we'll have it submitted by law enforcement and then we'll we will work it. Um, it's locked down so the prosecutors can't see it. Law enforcement can't see the results either. Something I never knew. Never knew. I thought that they always mm -hmm. had to go to an independent lab or facility, which I guess they still do. They still do a lot because they they still think that um, 
that we're bi- uh, more biased toward prosecution just because that's the bulk of the work that we do it for. But I guess sometimes when I really show them that there are a lot of times we tell law enforcement, sorry, but you got the wrong person or, you know, we clear a lot of people that are accused of something. We are objective and it, we are not, you know, just working for the prosecution. And they're slowly coming over that. And some judges actually will insist that they uh, ask the lab if they can do it before they go off to find a, an expensive vendor lab that can do it. Yeah, I, I guess it's expensive. And then plus the credentials of whoever's coming in, because we may get to that, hopefully, is to talk about what it takes to be. You mentioned something, Marcy, about competency. And I'd like to come back to that at some point, what that means and how you get there, because you can't just usually march in and say, well, I work for a lab and I say this. I'm, I'm sure it's much more than that. But I never knew that they that they actually got that to, to especially the quiet nature of the way that comes in. Never knew that. But it makes sense. Do you have anything? I was just wondering, what is the turnaround time once you mm-hmm. start processing? I know you said that they get irritated because it takes a long time. What typically is the turnaround time once you start on that particular DNA or whatever testing you're doing? Right now, from the time that you submit a case for drugs, it'll be turned around in about 30 to 60 days. In toxicology, it's about 60 to 90, depending on if you need alcohol and then drugs. And if you need the drugs, how many are in there? A lot of people don't take just one drug. You know, they're taking three or four drugs um, with or without the alcohol. So that actually takes, it's not just one test. You have to do a test per drug type. So again, that's a little bit 60 to 90 days on those Trace, it just really depends on the type of analysis it is. If it is an arson case, usually you can get that out in 30 days or less. If it's a gunshot residue, we have a backup in that area. We had the instrument go down one time. It took us forever to get it repaired, and it backed us up almost a year on those, and they're working through it. Um, I see the look on your face. When we have biology right now, it is running an average of 11 months, but it's closer if it's positive to really being about 14 months to get the lab results back. Wow. And I've, I'm guessing they probably have no idea when they submit that, that maybe a year from now you'll get your things back. Yes. And that's largely because of the backlog. And we had um, pay issues where we had constant turnover. So you'd get people in, you'd get them trained. And that was a year and a half, two years to get people up and trained and, and independently working cases. Um, they'd get a year or two in and they'd be gone. So at one point we had like, if you looked back over five years, we had a 36 to 40 percent turnover rate. Where so, did they, where did they go? Other labs. Locally or did they haul it across the country to bigger markets? Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. So we train them and we just hand them off to make more money somewhere else. That, that, that's good to know. That's a, because we, if you're going to get in this field, you got to kind of sense what the market is and what that means if you have to relocate or go somewhere else. And, uh, you know, at the Lexington Police Department back years ago, we were a farm team before we got some pay equity. It was we would grab somebody. You still remember this because and you were there, Marcy, at the same time frame is we'd train them, put them out. And then uh, J-Town, an hour west, would uh, start them at maybe, I guess, 15 grand more a year. And they were taking the good ones. You know, you've always got somebody leaves that you hold the door for. Well, they weren't taking those. They were they were taking the good ones. So I hate hearing that. And then the pressure it puts, the pressure, you know, there the is court. good news. Yeah. As of July 1st, we just got a substantial pay raise. Finally. Congratulations. Thank you. Good okay. deal. Thanks Thank to the legislature. Thanks to the legislature. Good. Exactly. Fantastic. So Fantastic. hopefully we will have better retention going forward. And we're also bringing on um, a, or basically flipping the section. Historically, you would bring in evidence and we would test it for, we'd do the serology testing first. Um, we would look for the blood, the semen, the saliva, or we would swab for touch. And then once we had that, we would write the report as to what we found that item one contains blood. And then it would go on, it would get into the DNA line. And that serology part right now is taking, is, is the bulk of our backlog right now as far as time. We are flipping it. We are getting ready probably by the end of the year, the beginning of next year, to do what we call direct-to-DNA, where the sample comes in and with sexual assault kit or um, a blood sample, we're going to run it for DNA first, get a profile, and then we'll go back and figure out, you know, was that blood, that semen or whatever. That becomes the second step. That way you've got your DNA right away, know whether or not it matches. 
your suspect or if it hits to somebody in the database. And then it also speeds up a lot of other processes because there'll be a lot of cases where we won't need to do the serology side of it. So that drops a lot of our workload. So the hope is, is that if we can bring it online by the end of this year, the beginning of next year, give a year to work through our backlog, that hopefully we are flipping cases out in 90 days or less, at least for the DNA portion. Did that take an advance in technology to, because when you're talking about putting it online, that makes me think that what's changed to make that feasible? Because then coming from the old days, waiting on t- man waiting and the cost it was it, it, again people don't understand that when we're talking about how long you had to wait when you're talking about taking things to a freezer all that was very real have there been changes and advances in the technology of of analyzing this stuff that have picked up the pace to make that even possible to put it in the front uh, we purchased some instruments that are we call them cadillacs um it's just kind of our code word for them they are uh they basically send the samples through an, a robotic extraction process and I believe they'll also do the amplification. Yes, the instruments you're talking about. Uh, so we we use robotics already. Um, it's just that there's a lot of human intervention between each step. These Cadillacs that she's referring to, there's less human inter- intervention. So they'll be able to take handle most of the process without us having to go in there and move it from one robot to another. But it's interesting that you bring this up because the um, the technology has changed so much over even just the 22 years I've been working there. It's like I think sometimes people look at people like us who may have a few gray hairs and they think, well, that person's going to be resistant to change. Well, in the field of DNA, all we've ever known is change. And it's constantly progressing and getting more sensitive and, and getting improving. And it's just been amazing to watch it all. From my vantage point, it was. And I don't think we were doing it when I left. But, you know, we're, we're coming to the point where everybody in a, the PD will have to have DNA exemplars on file, just like our fingerprints. You know, the old thing of, uh, oh, by the way, lines, that was your fingerprint on the, on the victim's wallet. You know, that, that stupid stuff. But, you know, and all kidding aside, is that if that sensitivity continues like that, is that you're going to have to have that because uh, uh, I, I would foresee uh, respirators being part of a of a, a crime scene thing, not just booties and Tyvek suits and bonnets anymore. Is that if you go in and cough, I mean, is it is it unlikely to say that there'll be a point where you could pick up uh, my DNA from sneezing or coughing in a scene? Is that something? Oh, yeah. We could definitely get your DNA from you coughing or sneezing at a scene now. And and just to give you an example, so any profile that we generate, anytime there's extra DNA present, I always compare it against myself because I'm the examiner and I'm handling it so I could contaminate it. So this is just one of the many checks that we do. When I have a foreign profile, I check it against myself. I check it against other people in the laboratory. And this is just routine. So if an officer... We do request now if people are willing to give an elimination sample for our staff database and officer database, we take them now and we can compare them. And that is really just to say, okay, that's not the real killer. We know who that came from so that it isn't used against you in court. Oh, for sure. You're heading things off. It, it won't even, yeah, I like that. You will probably won't even get asked. If they see that in the file. It's also um, important because, you know, sometimes we get a profile and, you know, it doesn't match anybody at the lab. It doesn't match your victim. um, And we think that's the bad guy. So we throw them in the database to go see. And it ends up it's and they may find or develop another suspect, but say, no, you know, he's in the database already or something. But it's not because we've put in an assu- a, a profile that they assume is the bad guy and it's really the a law enforcement officer it doesn't go anywhere doesn't get anything or or like this sometimes happens where you have blood at a scene and you put it into codis and you find out or or, or for example semen from a, a victim and turns out that was her boyfriend, Seaman, but he's also a convicted offender, but he's not the one accused of raping her. So we get some surprises every once in a while. Yeah, but they're clarifying. Yes. yes. There yes. was a time and, you couldn't get that. I'd be grateful. And, and when that happens, if, if, if that is known to come from a consensual partner, it comes back out of CODIS. I got you. That's good to because know, Because we only want, we can only put the crime scene samples in there. 
So it, uh, we'll talk. Can you talk about a little bit of DNA? If if we looked at the history of DNA and if we could like put it down to a handful of watershed moments, what would that look like chronology wise? Like uh, what have been the maybe the four or five big things that have happened in the last few decades? Can it be reduced to that that amount? Well, DNA was discovered in 1953 by Watson and Crick. Gotcha. You don't want to go back that far, do you? No. <laughs> but it's neat. But you know what this I think the listeners are going to – because it, it's it, it's a good conversation to have because it, one is learning about the history of it I think is important. Because I'm already thinking, you know where I'm going is like mitochondrial, okay? And then, you know, again, the Star trek thing of touch DNA bullshit. That's never – you know, it, that, that kind of a thing. So that is good to know. But it, and again, maybe we can talk about what can happen with it and what can't because it – it becomes a beast of its own out in, in the community to where people have, I think, unrealistic expectations of it. I've always worried that I think sometimes we may be cultivating jurors that believe when they walk in the courtroom that if that's not there, it doesn't – that the crime didn't occur. And that's a dangerous thing. So I think we can do that. But what, or were there major advances after its 1953 discovery that, that kind of moved the ball forward? Well, from the forensic perspective – it all started in the 80s. So in the 80s, they discovered this technology called RFLP, uh, which stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. And that is the traditional DNA fingerprint. So that started over in UK. They were using it to solve a murder, and they literally went around and collected samples from every man in the town to try to match up this DNA. And it kind of snowballed from there. And then RFLP came to the States and Lucy Davis went up to the FBI to learn how to bring it into our lab. And then so RFLP took a lot of sample and a lot of cases just don't have that much sample. So we weren't doing DNA on a lot of cases back then because it would take like a quarter size stain of blood. And you just don't have that at a, at a lot of scenes. So PCR came online. That was the next big, big thing. PCR revolutionized everything. So you can take now this tiny little amounts of blood and get full profiles from that. How does that work? What's PCR stand for? PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And I think of it, well, when I go to court, I explain it like a Xerox machine. We're looking at specific locations on the DNA, DNA that doesn't really code for anything. It's in the junk DNA. So it doesn't, it's not going to tell your insurance that you might have certain diseases in your family lineage, anything like that. It's just really just different numbers in the junk DNA, different repeat units. So we look at these locations on the DNA and we use it like kind of like a Xerox machine. We're making millions of copies of those locations. And when it started, when we first brought it in-house, we were looking at 13 locations. And now we're looking at 24. So Pretty neat stuff. So RFLP, PCR, we're just about covering the alphabet. We're getting close. What was next after that? Well, that takes us up to current modern day. Gotcha. Biggest change, though, was the addition of the robotics, where everything used to be, you know, you were pipetting, um, you know, doing uh, the uh, centrifuge. Everything was by hand, one by one. Um, with the robots, we developed 96 well plates that they um, were dealing with. When I was doing DNA with RFLP, you know, we were working with 8 and 16 samples. Now they're dealing with uh, 96 well plates that... It's samples, but it's also uh, different controls that are in there and blanks. So it lets them handle more and more. And then with it being on the robotics, as they work on the robotics, the analyst has time to go do either pull more samples um, or go do data interpretation of some of the other samples. The more hands off they are, the more time they have to do other work with the cases. Yeah, one of the interesting, one of the best things about the robots when the robots came online is that it gave us such a higher quality DNA extract as well. And I'll give you one example. I had this case that I worked shortly after the robots came online. And when I'm talking about, we have robots at every step now. Uh, this one is the extraction robot. It was a case, a child abuse case from somewhere out in Western Kentucky. And they surmised that the child had been beaten against the fireplace. And so they had gone in with some luminol 
uh, because you couldn't see the blood. And they had collected some swabs and these swabs were black. So with my old extraction method, I probably would not have been able to get a profile simply because there would have been too many other things in the extract that would have been inhibiting the reaction. But with the robots, I got a very clean extract and I got a profile and it matched. Incredible. So Incredible. that's one of my favorite things about the robots. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, you've mentioned uh, the GSR and different DNA testing and this type thing. So I'm guessing you might get in a semen sample or you all may get a bloody gun or a bloody knife. Is that right? You just get various types of things to examine at your lab, correct? Yes. Yes. I have a window that overlooks the front parking lot. And there have been times, there was one time uh, one of the agencies pulled up and next thing I know, there's a bed frame coming through the parking lot. Hey, you know there's more to the story, so go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at murderpolicepodcast.com, which is our website and has show notes for imagery and audio and video files related to the cases you're going to hear. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and YouTube, which has closed captions available for those that are hearing impaired. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. Subscribe to the Murder Police Podcast and set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.